When transitioning from 2D to 3D game development, there are many new concepts you'll need to get familiar with, such as textures, materials, normals, low-poly and high-poly models, and much more. It might seem overwhelming at first, but don't worry. In this video, we'll cover everything you need to know to get a solid understanding of 3D development. So, let's dive in. When you open Blender, you'll be presented with a default scene, which includes a cube. If you're not familiar with Blender, it's a free and open source software that has many use cases. As a game developer, I primarily use it to create 3D models that I then bring into Unity. You can think of Blender as being like Photoshop, but for 3D objects instead of 2D images. Now, the cube you see in the default scene is a 3D object, meaning it exists in three-dimensional space. This is different from 2D images or drawings that only have width and height. In 3D, we have an additional dimension which is depth. In Blender, you'll notice three colored lines intersecting at the center of the cube. These represent the X, Y, and Z axes. The red line is the X axis, typically representing left and right. The green line is the Y axis, usually representing forward and backward. The blue line is the Z axis, representing up and down. Let's take a closer look at the cube. It's important to understand that this 3D object is composed of three main elements, vertices, edges, and faces. Vertices are the corner points of the cube. Edge are the lines that connect the vertices. Faces are the flat surfaces that fill the space between the edges. Now that we understand the basic components of 3D objects, let's talk about how models are typically created for games. There are mainly two primary techniques involved in 3D modeling. First one is polygon modeling. This method involves starting with basic shapes like cubes, spheres, or cylinders, which we call primitives. We then manipulate these shapes by inserting new vertices, moving existing vertices or edges to create desired shape. For example, we might start with a cube, extrude some faces to create arms and legs, and then refine the shape by moving individual vertices. The second method is sculpting, which is more like traditional clay sculpting but in a digital environment. We typically start with a basic shape and then use brush-like tools to push, pull, smooth and shape the surface. This method is great for creating organic shapes and highly detailed models. However, there's a significant downside to sculpted models in game development. These models are often extremely dense, with a very high polygon count. While this allows for incredible detail, it poses a problem for real-time rendering in games. In games, we need to process these models in real-time to achieve smooth performance, typically aiming for 60 frames per second or higher. Current hardware, even high-end gaming PCs and consoles, can't handle rendering millions of polygons for multiple objects at this speed. This is where we see a big difference between game assets and those used in films. In movies like Kong Skull Island, they can use incredibly high-poly models because they don't need to render them in real time. Each frame can take hours to render, resulting in amazingly detailed characters and environments. For games, we need to find a balance. We often start with a high poly sculpt to get all the details we want, but then we go through a process called retopology. This involves creating a new low poly version of the model that's optimized for real time rendering. We then bake the details from the high poly version onto the low poly model using normal maps and other texture maps. Normal maps are a clever technique we use to fake high levels of detail on a low poly model. After baking the normal map, we use the low poly model in the game and discard the high poly model. This way, we can have models that look highly detailed, but are actually much more efficient for the game engine to process. Now that we've created our 3D model, we want to add color and texture to it. In 2D art, you'd simply color your sketch directly. However, in 3D, it's not that straightforward. We need to go through a process called UV unwrapping. UV unwrapping is like flattening out a 3D object, similar to how you'd unfold a cardboard box to make it flat. This creates a 2D representation of our 3D model surface, which we call a UV map. The term UV might seem odd at first. U represents the horizontal axis, and V represents the vertical axis of this 2D map. You might wonder why not just use X and Y? Well, in 3D space, we already use X, Y, and Z to describe the position of our model. To avoid confusion, we use U and V for our 2D texture space. This UV map is crucial because it tells the computer exactly how to wrap a 2D texture around our 3D model. Imagine you're gift wrapping a present. The UV map is like instructions showing exactly where each part of the wrapping paper should go. Once we have our UV map, we can apply various types of textures to our 3D model. 
These textures go beyond just color, they work together to create a highly realistic appearance. This process allows us to add intricate details to our models, whether it's complex patterns, realistic textures like skin or fabric. For instance, normal maps, as we discussed earlier, create the illusion of surface detail without increasing the geometry. Ambient occlusion maps add subtle shadows in areas where light is less likely to reach, enhancing the perception of depth. Another important texture is the roughness map, which controls how rough or smooth different parts of the surface appear at a micro level. These are just a few examples of the textures available, but there are many others. You might be thinking, that's a lot of textures, and you'd be right. Simply stacking all these textures on top of each other would result in chaos. This is where materials come in. A material acts like a recipe, instructing the renderer on how to combine these different textures. It defines how your object interacts with light. In game engines like Unity or Unreal, there are various types of materials or shaders that are tailored to specific combinations of texture maps. And finally, we use these models in game engines like Unity and Unreal Engine. These engines are where all our hard work comes together. They take our optimized 3D models, apply the materials we've created, and render them in real time to create our game worlds. Now, I know this is a lot to take in at once. Don't get overwhelmed by all this information. I remember when I first started learning 3D modeling and game development, it felt like drinking from a fire hose. There were so many new terms and concepts to understand. But here's the thing, as you practice and work with these tools, all these terms and processes will become clearer to you. It's like learning a new language. At first, it's all gibberish, but gradually, it starts to make sense. I've done my best to explain these concepts in depth so that you won't get confused when you encounter them while learning. It took me months to understand these things clearly, so don't worry if it doesn't all click right away. Take your time, experiment, and don't be afraid to make mistakes. That's how we learn. In our next video, we'll discuss some of the best tools we can use to speed up this process. While Blender is incredibly powerful and can do pretty much everything when it comes to ease of use and speed, it's not always the optimal choice for every task. We'll look at some specialized tools that can make certain parts of the 3D modeling and texturing process much faster and easier. If you found this video useful and want to learn more about 3D modeling and game development, don't forget to like and subscribe. Your support helps me create more content like this. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.